All right. Welcome everyone to the second uh, talk of this uh, half-baked colloquia series for this semester. And today we're very pleased to have uh, Matthew Adams from uh, um, the Department of Philosophy of Indiana University uh, Bloomington, uh, where Matthew is an assistant professor. Um, Matthew received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Virginia in 2018 and was then a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Ethics in Society at Stanford University. Um, he, his work on food has concerned uh, issues related to ethics, politics, and uh, also aesthetics, like, like landscape. And, um, and uh, today he's going to uh, talk about um, healthy eating and justice issues with respect to that. Uh, I'll leave to Matthew the floor. One thing I can, I should add before doing that is that if you have questions, you can also ask them in chat. Okay, and then uh, we will collect them. We have also Google Drive in case we have a lot of questions. And another really important thing is that we posted a handout that Matthew is going to use for the talk here in the chat is the second link that you find. And uh, so that's a PDF that he's going to use. Okay, Matthew, you have the floor. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for that um, kind uh, introduction, and it's a great pleasure to meet everyone on Zoom. So I want you to begin by imagining what I think is a fairly familiar scene from American suburban life, maybe less common in Italy, but <laughs> common in the United States. A family pulls up to a fast food restaurant and orders hamburgers, fries, and soda for dinner something you can even do, do during the time of COVID. <laughs> um, so the scene raises ethical concerns about the health impact of their meal and about human and how non-human animals were treated at various stages of the supply chain in order to produce their meal. Um, I think the scene also raises political questions about what background institutional structure leads many families to make this type of food choice on a regular basis. To a significant degree, um, this type of choice is influenced by the industrialization of the American food supply system from the 1950s onwards, government subsidies of corn which have made the price of beef artificially low in particular, and the price and availability of alternative healthy options. I think sort of relatedly food also has an important social dimension. For example, the motif of solitary, technologically infused eating is a ubiquitous feature of 21st century living in sort of almost all wealthy industrialized countries. Um, in the novel Infinite Jest, David Foster Wallace captures this motif with an image of a medical attache who consumes TV dinners from a specially designed tray. Wallace writes, the tray is molded over his head so that his shoulders support the tray and allow it to project into space just below his chin that he may enjoy his hot dinner without having to remove his eyes from whatever entertainment is up and playing. He's wordlessly attended by his wife who keeps his beard free of any debris that falls from the tray. Um, and this image I think seems so haunting, at least to me, because it shows that the way in which food is consumed can reveal a form of social disunity that's at least as disturbing as the poor physical health that food can sometimes induce. So in the actual world, as these two opening examples illustrate, food consumption and culture often reflect and perpetuate structural injustice and defective social practices. But the function that food performs in our lives is highly contingent. In the contemporary US, people increasingly see food and medicine as independent, even though they're aware that food has an important impact on health. But at various points in history, such as in the Byzantine Empire, food and medicine have been seen as tightly connected concepts that perform the same function. Um, the basic idea, if, if you're not familiar with this period, is that foods like medicine were seen as balancing bodily humors rather like all other forms of um, medicine. So in the US, people increasingly eat alone, but again, in many traditional cultures, particularly in Chinese culture, eating alone is seen as a cultural taboo. So in summary, food has a deep impact on many different dimensions of our lives, but this function is highly contingent. 
these facts mean that food has significant social and political potential. In particular, it's possible to engineer food policies that make food perform a better function and thereby help to overcome injustice and defective social practices. So kind of inspired by this possibility, I'm working on a new project that explores the policy idea of providing access to free healthy food as a way of ameliorating different types of injustice. So I'm excited to present some of this research to you this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are <laughs> in the world, and to defend, defend the policy in two different forms. First, I'm going to argue that providing healthy food can be an effective means of reducing current healthcare costs and improving healthcare outcomes. Second, I'll argue that providing free for healthy food to at least some members of the community of people, irrespective of their current healthcare status, can realize a number of values. It can promote public health in a broad sense, um, it can diminish gender-based inequality, and it can help to constitute certain egalitarian relationships and to increase solidarity. Okay, so these are both ways in which access to free healthy food can improve actual societies that aren't fully just at the moment. Um, just a couple of opening clarifications. I'm going to be using the term free in a slightly expansive sense, such that free access is compatible with there being a small standardized fee that doesn't reflect the actual cost of food. I think here the analogy of so-called free healthcare is instructive. It's conventional to say that universal coverage systems provide people with access to free healthcare, even though small standardized fees can and often are imposed on patients. For instance, in the UK, um, the NHS charges patients small standardized fees for their free pharmaceutical prescriptions. Um, now, there's one way in which free healthy food can be provided that also falls out Beside the scope of the type of policy that I'm interested in defending. This is free food that is provided as an act of charity and consequently is conceptualized as a discretionary act that's provided by a group of people to help another group of people in need. So in contrast, I'm concerned with access to free healthy food that's a type of communal or public good. Paradigmatically, such goods are financed by the state, um, but I'll suggest that in conditions in which the state is sufficiently unjust, it can be preferable to finance access to free healthy food through local cooperative schemes. So the policy of providing access to free, relatively healthy food has sometimes been implemented. In ancient Rome, for instance, the dole of subsidized or free grain and later bread was provided by the government to about 200,000 of the poorest residents of the city. And in the 20th century, it's been implemented with various degrees of success in various communist countries. Um, despite the fact that the policy has sometimes been implemented, I think that it's fair to say that it's been rarely implemented, particularly in modern economically developed um, democratic countries. Other policies to try to regulate types of food access have been far more common. So in the US, there are things like federally sponsored programs such as food stamps that are just provided to relatively poor people. But such recipients have a lot of discretion about whether to use such stamps to purchase healthy food or junk food. And more generally, food banks and soup kitchens in developed countries around the world only provide food, again, of drawing nutritional value to the poorest. Such initiatives are also heavily dependent on charitable contributions and non-profit organizations. Consequently, they're acts of charity rather than sort of public or communal goods in the sense that I'm going to be concerned with. Okay, um, so when it comes to promoting access to healthy food in particular, rather than food in general, most public policies take the form of either taxing or banning unhealthy options. For instance, Denmark um, imposes taxes of various forms on unhealthy foods such as saturated fats and sugars. And most of the large social scientific literature on promoting access to healthy food has mirrored actual political practice by focusing on the policy option of taxing unhealthy options. It's also considered how such options could be combined with policies that subsidize access to healthy food options such as vegetables particularly in low-income food deserts. Okay, 
Um, so although the policy of providing access to free healthy food has largely been overlooked in favor of alternative policies, I don't think that its potential should be neglected. And I'm going to highlight some of the advantages that it has over other more prominently discussed food policies in my talk. Okay, so free healthy food can be provided under different types of parameters. I want to be Again, by considering, and might be helpful to look at the handout, a limited way in which it could be provided that I term opt-in medical access. This is free healthy food is provided to some people who choose to avail of the food as part of a treatment for a specific medical condition. So one way of defending this type of access is to argue that it's a cost-effective means of improving the current status quo, specifically reducing health costs and improving healthcare outcomes given the specific conditions that can obtain in countries like the US in the present. So I want to pause to clarify the type of argument that I'm making here. Um, the status quo is clearly vulnerable to moral criticism. Um, it can be challenged on the normative ground that it's wrong that millions of Americans still don't have access to free healthcare. And also, if you like, on the efficiency based ground, that a system of universal coverage would be more cost effective than the current patchwork system that finances individual plans through private insurance premiums. But I guess for better or worse, the current system in places where we are at the moment, and it's therefore helpful to hold even arguably problematic features of the status quo constant and ask how providing healthy food could make the current system in place a more cost effective way of producing better healthcare outcomes. Okay, so in that spirit, I want to begin by arguing that each type of healthcare treatment should satisfy a number of empirical conditions. First, it should satisfy what I call an efficacy condition. Each type of healthcare treatment should appear to be a generally effective means to some reasonable degree of treating people who are unhealthy and or promoting public healthcare. Um, I think we want to leave some room here for reasonable disagreement about what threshold of efficacy is necessary. All I'm presupposing is that healthcare treatment should be effective to at least some degree. I take this to be a pretty uncontroversial claim. Imagine there are no good reasons for thinking that a particular type of healthcare treatment um, had any effect on health. It would then seem, I think, like a bizarre cultural veneration of this type of healthcare practice to insist that it should be retained and in particular that it should be in any way public compliance. Um, second, it's not sufficient for healthcare to satisfy the efficacy condition because it must also satisfy an opportunity cost condition. In order to justify using a particular type of healthcare in a particular type of circumstance, there cannot be something else which is not healthcare um, that appears to be a generally more effective means of treating people who are unhealthy and or promoting public health in the circumstances, at least to some reasonable degree. And there cannot be something which is not healthcare that prevents the need to treat people using healthcare in that type of circumstance from arising in the first place, at least to the same degree. So the opportunity cost condition includes the following caveat. All other salient variables are held constant when making the comparison. Essentially, the non-healthcare option is no more expensive, painful, or anything else in the healthcare. So if a patient has cancer, then her doctor should encourage her to seek treatment such as chemotherapy, rather than to put her faith in potions of wild herbs that have been cooked by, say, a full moon. Um, but this is just because, as a contingent matter of fact, such potions do not cure cancer. If counterfactually such potions were more effective than chemotherapy and had the added bonus of being cheaper and less painful, then they should be used to treat the cancer. To deny this and the more general opportunity cost condition would be to artificially fetishize traditional forms of medical treatment and seems contrary to the central normative standard that guides the selection of medical treatments at least within the paradigm of evidence-based medicine. A treatment should be adopted because the, there is evidence that it is, other things being equal, the most effective means of treating a medical condition. So the second part of the opportunity cost condition, essentially that non-medical preventative measures are preferable to medical treatments, reflects the judgments that people would prefer other things being equal not to get unhealthy in the first place than to have good medical treatment once they are in fact unhealthy. 
So when deciding whether a particular treatment should be provided under a specific system of universal coverage, we may face difficult trade-offs. For instance, the question of whether a marginally more effective but much more expensive treatment should be provided. However, the caveat bypasses these difficult normative questions because it merely captures the comparatively uncontroversial assumption that an alternative and more effective treatment should be adopted, at least if it's no more expensive and painful. My argument's only going to require this comparatively uncontroversial assumption because fortunately, healthy food is both standardly cheaper and less painful than healthcare, at least for all but the most pathologically fussy eaters. <laughs> most people would prefer to eat. <laughs> okay, so my key dialectical move is going to be to argue that, at least in some instances, traditional forms of healthcare cannot satisfy the opportunity cost condition. By traditional forms of healthcare, I mean things like pharmaceutical drugs or treatment by doctors or nurses. Um, this is because healthy food is a more um, effective means of treating people who are unhealthy and promoting health, public health by preventing them from becoming unhealthy at least to the same degree in the first place. Therefore, at the very minimum, access to free healthy food should be provided under parameters that can be classified as optimum medical access. So in order to show this, I want to actually draw on a really interesting actual case study that's recently emerged. Um, in Philadelphia, a nonprofit organization called MANA um, undertook a pilot study. And the study tried to determine the health impact of providing three healthy meals a day to a sample of chronically ill Medicare recipients over a 12 month period. The diet provided was optimal for their health condition, which requires, amongst other things, having a low sodium diet. So when compared to the control group, the sample group's average health care costs were approximately $13,000 less each month, and they had 50% less hospital visits, and these visits were 37% shorter. So quite, quite a remarkable set of findings in a way. Um, I guess the kind of limitation of this pilot study is that the size of the sample group was relatively small at 65 people. But the broad findings of the study have been corroborated by MANA's subsequent partnership with four major health insurance plans who provided reimbursable healthy meals and subsequently reported significant cost reductions and improved health outcomes. A more comprehensive set of data will be available in the near future because California recently piloted a program called Food as Medicine. I'm not sure if anyone has heard of it, um, <laughs> that will run from 2018 to 2021. This program is inspired by MANA's study and it will provide free healthy meals to a thousand Medicaid patients with a chronic healthcare condition of congested heart disorder. So this Food as Medicine program is gonna cost Californian taxpayers about $6 million, but one of its aims is to reduce healthcare costs to taxpayers, particularly those resulting from the hospitalization of Medicaid patients with congestive heart disorder. This is a condition that has you know, one of the highest rates of hospital readmissions. Um, okay, so the evidence from the MANA pilot study very strongly suggests that providing free healthy food to certain patients on Medicaid with congestive heart disorder would reduce healthcare costs and produce at least as good healthcare outcomes. Consequently, if such food was not provided, and such patients were merely treated using traditional healthcare treatments, this would fail to satisfy the opportunity cost condition. Um, so the example of providing free healthy food to certain patients on Medicaid with congestive heart disorder um, is almost certainly sufficient to defend optimum medical access. It's a kind of open empirical question as to how broadly the opportunity cost condition could justify providing free healthy food to different classes of people in order to treat other medical conditions or to prevent them from developing at least to the same degree in the first place. Um, so I think casting the argument for access to free healthy food as a means of reducing healthcare costs and improving healthcare outcomes has a number of appeals. Um, in a political context such as the US, it's rhetorically powerful because many people of different ideological persuasions um, are motivated to reduce healthcare costs. Um, relatedly, from a more theoretical perspective, 
it will be appealing to political philosophers working broadly in the post Rawlsian tradition of public reason who think that public policy should be compatible with reasonable pluralism. The policy is one of people of different comprehensive conceptions of justice, whether Rawlsian, utilitarian, or anything else, can reach a consensus about, or at least converge on, for different reasons. Even certain libertarians who don't think the state should provide free health care could agree that the policy is better than the status quo, at least insofar as it reduces the health care costs to the taxpayer. But I think crossing the argument in this form also has some limitations. Most importantly, by viewing the benefit of free healthy food in narrow medical terms, it neglects the broader social and political potential of food. Um, so in order to capture a way in which access to free healthy food can serve a broader social and political function, I'm gonna explore a different type of parameter under which it can be provided. Um, this is a type of access that I term opt-in open access. Free healthy food is available to at least some members of the community um, who choose to avail of the food. And crucially, in contrast to opt-in medical access, this first type of access that I've defended, this food is provided irrespective of their current health status, and it's provided outside the medical context. So in order to defend this type of access, I also want to consider an actual case in which it's been successfully implemented, the Bora Community Kitchen in Mumbai. Um, the kitchen was set up in 2012 by a community of Boras, a sect of Shia Islam. There are approximately 2,200 Bora Muslim families in the city, and nearly half of them um, have become members of the community kitchen. So each day the kitchen delivers healthy cooked food to each household that's sufficient for two, the two main meals of the day. And the kitchen is financed as a type of co-op. Um, each family pays a fixed amount each month. Crucially, however, membership is not contingent on an ability to pay the proportional cost of the food received. Wealthier families pay two or three times the cost of the food that they receive in order to subsidize poorer families. Um, so consequently, poor families have access to the same quantity and quality of food as rich families for a token payment that doesn't reflect the actual cost of the food that they received. So this can be classified as a type of access to free healthy food in the slightly more expensive sense um, that I clarified that I'm using the term. So the Borough Community Kitchen has three main aims. First, to ensure that everyone has access to a sufficient amount of healthy, nutritious food. Um, before the kitchen was set up, many people in the community weren't getting enough nutritious food. Second, the kitchen was set up in order to reduce gender inequality. Before the kitchen was introduced, women were expected to cook meals for their families. Um, this often involved many hours of daily labor in cramped kitchens, inhaling smoke from wood-fired ovens that was a serious health hazard. After the kitchen was implemented, women had more time to pursue other options, including things like religious activities, education, and employment. Third, I think the kitchen clearly has a much broader social aim. Um, in Michael Pollan's documentary, Cooked, several members of the community kitchen are interviewed. One person remarks, there's no class system, we're all equal. Another, that nobody should feel pride in being rich and nobody should feel shame in being poor. Everyone eats the same food. So I think interpreting these remarks in a more theoretical vein, we might say that the way in which the same food is distributed to different families helps to constitute a type of egalitarian relationship in which all the families are accorded the same status by being nourished by the same food. Um, the constitution of this egalitarian relationship also helps to enhance an accompanying sense of solidarity in which all the different members feel part of the same community. So note that the first aim um, is what political philosophers call sufficientarian. It aims to make sure that certain people have enough of something. They have the right threshold of healthy food. The second two aims are egalitarian because they're concerned with making certain social relationships more equal in, in crucial respects. And I think the fact that a communal food system can simultaneously realize these three very different aims illustrates that I think sometimes overlooked um, social and political potential of food. Um, 
Note that there could be some tension between the realization of the first aim and the other two aims if the first aim was understood as trying to provide people with an optimally healthy diet. This is because eating an optimally healthy diet may not be appealing to that many people if it requires, as it possibly does, um, giving up certain non-optimally healthy foods that are either delicious or have cultural significance. Consequently, less people would choose to opt into the community kitchen, which would undermine the broader realization of the two egalitarian values. The communal kitchen, however, seems sensitive to this and doesn't aspire to provide optimally healthy food, but rather relatively healthy food and nutritious food that retains the cultural and culinary traditions of the Boer community. So in this case, it includes things like um, sort of mutton curry dal and roti bread. I think so here a more general lesson can be extracted. If we care about the broader egalitarian values that food can secure, then construing the provision of free healthy food in narrow medical terms, i.e. as promoting an optimally healthy diet given a particular person's health needs is limiting. Um, when we discover an innovative and successful scene like the Borough Community Kitchen, it's natural to think how it could work elsewhere in countries such as the US, for example. Um, caution, however, is required just because something is successful under a specific set of conditions doesn't mean that it can be successfully exported to somewhere that is significantly different like the US. So what follows, we want to make a type of prima facie case that it could work in the US, whilst also flagging um, some complexities. In order to do this, I'll begin by looking at each of the aims of the kitchen in turn and consider how they could be valuable and workable in some significantly different conditions such as in the US. So I'll begin by considering the sufficientarian aim to ensure that certain relatively poor people in the community are able to eat healthy food. Clearly the US is significantly richer than India and the number of people who live in extreme poverty is significantly lower. This doesn't however mean that everyone in the US is able to afford a healthy diet. There's plenty of empirical evidence that low income individuals and families are forced to eat cheaper, high calorie foods that have low nutritional value. Furthermore, even if people have sufficient money to purchase health ingredients, this doesn't mean that they have access to healthy food in the relevant sense. This is because people who have to work very long hours for relatively low wages have limited time, energy and inclination to prepare healthy food using healthy ingredients. Consequently, many of them understandably gravitate towards more convenient junk foods, even if they can afford to purchase healthy ingredients to cook with. So I think in this respect, there's an important contrast to be drawn between people who have to work very long hours for relatively low wages and people like high powered professionals who have to work very long hours for high wages. Um, the latter class of people can buy back some of their lost time by paying for some of their daily chores and tasks like cleaning and cooking to be done by other people. The former cannot and often have more stress if they have to work multiple jobs on precarious employment contracts. Consequently, there's a significant number of people in the US that this is sufficient area and aim could benefit. And it's worth pausing to note here, I think, that this provides a reason to favor something like a community kitchen over the more prominently discussed policy options of subsidizing healthy food options. Given that money isn't the only barrier to accessing healthy foods, the requisite type of access can't be achieved merely by lowering the price of raw ingredients like vegetables in low income areas. Okay, let's consider the second aim of the community kitchen to reduce gender inequality. In contrast to India, women in the US don't endure the health hazard of inhaling smoke from wood-fired ovens. If you're lucky to have a wood-fired oven, it's probably like a pizza oven that's outside in the garden and <laughs> mostly ventilated. Um, <laughs> this is because, of course, food is hardly ever cooked using wood-fired ovens in a domestic context. Um, but the burden of preparing food in the US, as in India, does fall disproportionately on women. A study from 2014 to 2016, for example, found that in families with children, 80% of the women are the usual grocery shoppers and food preppers, and only 20% of men split meal preparation evenly with their wives. So this represents a significant time burden for women, 
mothers spend an average of 68 minutes per day on milk preparation compared to 23 minutes for fathers. Although more American men cook now than they once did, there's also an important class disparity that we shouldn't overlook. A study found that between 2003 to 2016, the percentage of college educated men cooking increased from 38% to 51%. But the percentage of men with less than high school education who cook remained constant during this period at about 33%. So American women who are employed face what Susanna Smith calls a double burden. They work to make money outside the home. But they're also usually responsible for a disproportionate amount of labor within the home. Um, many feminist philosophers have drawn attention to this domestic inequality. It's a form of labor that one of the forms that undergirds capitalist society, but isn't properly compensated. Of course, in a perfectly just society without patriarchal attitudes, that structure the social expectations of what women should do that wouldn't exist, at least in a disproportionate uncompensated form. But it remains a widespread feature of US society that we probably won't be able to overcome in the short term. Accordingly, something like a communal kitchen might be the best way of diminishing this inequality, at least with respect to food and uh, at least with respect to food preparation, and sort of giving women more time and power and to also sort of progress in different ways. I can expand a little more on some thoughts about this in the Q&A. Okay, um, finally, consider the third aim, um, helping to constitute an egalitarian relationship between the different members of the court and a heightened sense of solidarity. In contrast to the first two aims, this third aim aspires to realize more contested values. Although socialism is a diffuse tradition in political philosophy, it's tended to emphasize the values of freedom, equality, and solidarity. The co-op seems like an example of a socialist institution. Accordingly, it would be particularly congenial to people with socialist inclinations. But of course, not everyone has relatively robust commitments to realizing certain relationships of social equality. Indeed, some people actively oppose um, such commitments. Um, therefore, in contrast to often medical access, which people can converge on for different reasons. I think the co-op presupposes certain relatively robust commitments that many people couldn't converge on for different reasons. I don't think something like this is particularly surprising as we try to illuminate more dimensions of value surrounding access to free healthy food. We have to make more controversial starting points. So there's a sort of interesting theoretical trade there. Um, as a separate point, considerations of solidarity may well constrain the conditions under which something like the community kitchen can be successfully implemented. I think it's natural to push the following skeptical concern. The community kitchen was set up by a group of people who share a strong religious and cultural identity. This is not incidental. Um, even if the community kitchen heightened the sense of solidarity, it didn't create it ex nihilo. Rather, the group's antecedent solidarity was a precondition for the community kitchen's success. So I won't try to resolve the difficult and critical question of what degree of antecedent solidarity would be required in order for something like the community kitchen to be successful. Um, and in particular, the question of whether this degree of solidarity could only be possessed by a close knit religious or cultural group or it could be possessed by a residential neighborhood with people who have different religious and cultures. Um, however, I think it's worth emphasizing that it is an opt-in policy, um, so it won't require everyone in the community to opt-in, but just for some people to do so. Also, of course, if the community kitchen was successful, perhaps it could have a snowball effect that encouraged other people um, to join. I think it's important to highlight two reasons why it would, if possible, be valuable to introduce community kitchens to communities that are not antecedently close-knit religious or cultural groups. First, and most obviously, this would permit a broader implementation, um, because of course not everyone <laughs> is a close-knit religious group. Um, second, more subtly, this would type, constitute a type of solidarity that could be attractive or at least tolerable to people who are generally skeptical of the value of solidarity. Jacob Levy, for example, writes that ethno-cultural conceptions of peoplehood are difficult to reconcile with full equal membership for those outside the relevant group, and they provide normative reasons that press for greater homogeneity 
in order to engender greater solidarity, even when the grounds of membership are cultural and linguistic rather than ethnic or racial. The tight link between shared citizenship and shared nationality easily slides into unattractive majoritarian identity politics and threatens the liberty, equality of right, and equality of standing non-members." End of quote. Um, note, however, that sharing food is a thinner sort of non-ideological basis for solidarity than either a particular cultural or linguistic identity. Accordingly, I think it seems reasonable to conjecture that the solidarity that a community kitchen could enhance need not lead to the internal homogenization or external exclusion or was something like oppression that Levy decries. Indeed, it could help to constitute a type of egalitarian solidarity amongst a group of people that's expansive and that they would like if possible to extend to people who are not currently members of the group. Um, so the precise institutional realization of something like the community kitchen in the US would have to be sensitive to facts about cost, efficiency, culture, and work schedules. These would plausibly significantly vary from area to area. Settling on the precise form that institutional realization to take may well be difficult because different considerations would pull in different directions. For example, serving food in a communal space may have the most potential to enhance solidarity. However, in the US, as in India, many people would prefer to eat with members of their nuclear family. So it might be more appealing if the food was distributed to different households. <laughs> I guess we'd have to do that, at least in the time of COVID, <laughs> for the short term. Um, despite the fact that the institutional realization will have to be sensitive to various contingencies, I think that we can say some general things about how it should be realized. The values that the communal kitchen aspires to promote constrain its institutional realization. It can't be structured like a soup kitchen or food bank that relatively wealthy people finance as an act of charity to help different relatively poor people. This may be the most efficient way of achieving the sufficientarian aim of making sure that relatively poor people have access to a healthy diet, but would fail to realize the egalitarian values. Um, I also want to leave the question of the way in which it should be financed open, but again, different general considerations may pull us interestingly in different directions. Arguably, it should be at least publicly um, financed at the state or federal level. So one motivation for this is the observation that some local communities that would benefit most from a communal kitchen are poor and consequently may be able to finance, uh, may not be able to finance a communal kitchen or co-op at a sort of grassroots level. Um, but other considerations may support financing communal kitchens at the local level. Given that its egalitarian aims are controversial, one could argue um, that it shouldn't be financed at the state or federal level, particularly, of course, if it couldn't be something that is supported by a democratic procedure. In conditions in which the state is sufficiently unjust, it may be preferable to finance communal kitchens through local cooperative schemes for different justice-based considerations. For example, particularly in the context of recent announcements about immigration laws in the US, there are millions of undocumented people that are increasingly marginalized and vulnerable. On a certain conception of justice, it's permissible for local communities to oppose these federal policies. Indeed, this is kind of what's done to a lot of things like sanctuary cities that um, grant people who are legal certain status. Um, communal kitchens could aid this effort by creating an environment that's inclusive to undocumented people. Consequently, in order to retain local control of the communal kitchens, it might be preferable to finance them locally rather than through the federal government and perhaps also the state government. So in passing, um, I've already identified some comparative advantages of communal kitchens over other more promptly discussed food policies. Perhaps most importantly, merely subsidizing healthy food options and supporting food banks um, can't realize the deeper egalitarian aims of something like a communal kitchen. However, even putting aside these egalitarian concerns and viewing food policies exclusively from the perspective of public health, there are a number of additional reasons to favor community kitchens over other policies that aspire to promote access to healthy food. Um, there's a lot of empirical evidence 
the policies that educate people are not that effective, particularly with respect to reducing obesity, as some recent philosophers like Anne Barnhill have really kind of emphasized in the work. Um, so consequently, there's no guarantee that mere access to healthy food products, even subsidized healthy food products, will be sufficient to affect the social transformation necessary for improving public health. I think what we probably require is a more holistic approach that is sensitive to how the different variables like access, education, time, food cultures, and preferences interact with one another. Drawing, if you like, on a broadly rules in insight, it would be more effective to build just institutions like communal kitchens that condition people's outlook and preferences appropriately, rather than to rely on policies like taxes and subsidies that try to pull people in the right direction often in the context of a broad culture that is socially defective and unjust. Relatedly, I also want to suggest that there's something problematic about merely conceptualizing features of our current food system, particularly fast food and junk food, as public health problems that should be controlled through taxation. This seems insensitive to the underlying structural injustice in which poor people have adopted poor diets in response to stressful and poorly paid work. Um, so more, rather than merely imposing this traditional burden of taxation on them, um, perhaps it would be preferable to build a new food culture using institutions like communal kitchens. Okay, well, <laughs> I've gone on for about 40 minutes, so I'll probably round up that. Um, if I've made a kind of prima facie uh, case for how something like a communal kitchen could work in the US, of course, only a prima facie case, not an all things considered case. Um, if, we, if we wanted to sort of explore the idea further, I think we'd have to do some experiments and living, as Mill says, to see if it is something that would in fact work and how its institutional realization should be refined. I think all philosophy can kind of do is, is point towards certain values and point towards a certain type of institutional realization. Um, that might be able to realize them and is accordingly worthy of further consideration. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew, thanks. Uh, so this is quite thought provoking. It's a uh, you know, really interesting proposal. Uh, so uh, we are going to take now, I 